Good afternoon, friends, and thank you very much for being here this afternoon. As you are all aware, uh, one of the biggest moments in terms of our diplomatic engagement this year uh, will begin later during the week, and that is the visit of the Emperor and Empress of Japan to India on the 30th. For many of us, uh, this is the first in many ways. It is the first in the sense that the, it is the first time that the Emperor and Empress of Japan are coming to India. It is also a first that India has hosted two dignitaries after, uh, in, on a state visit after a lapse of 50 years. It's never happened before in the history of independent India. Um, as you are all aware, the importance that we place on this visit, I've requested our chief of protocol, uh, who is here with us, Ms. Ruchira Kamboj, to come along and explain to you uh, the efforts that we've made uh, to ensure the success of this visit. We also have with us, uh, for many of you, an old friend who is now Director East Asia and uh, who is uh, right now handling the visit, uh, Mr. Shamb uh, Shambhu Kumaran, who, is, uh, who will uh, respond to any questions that you may have on the visit other than the protocol aspects. So, with those introductory remarks, I will ask the Chief of Protocol to brief you, and then if you have any other questions on her briefing or from uh, Director East Asia, uh, they will both be willing to answer. And as usual, we will also open the floor for any questions that you may other have to have on any other issues. With those opening remarks, I request uh, the Chief of Protocol to uh, make her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Akbar, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here and to brief you on the program elements of this most significant uh, visit. Uh, to begin from the very beginning, their majesties will arrive on the 30th of November. It's a six-day visit in all, so it is a longish visit, arriving on the 30th of November, which is a Saturday, um, and uh, then moving on to Sunday, the 1st of December, where there would be uh, some private time where they will be taking a walk uh, in Lodi Garden. On the 2nd of December, which is Monday, the main day of engagement, uh, there would be the ceremonial welcome for their majesties at Rashtrapati Bhavan. Uh, thereafter, uh, their majesties would uh, pay their respects at Rajkhat. And after Rajkhat would proceed for a meeting with the Prime Minister at Hyderabad House. Uh, following that, there are a couple of private engagements, a visit to the Jawaharlal Nehru University, and finally that day, uh, the main event, the most significant event, the meeting with the president, followed by the banquet, the customary ba banquet, uh, which is very traditional for a state visit, followed by the farewell tete a tete. Uh, the next day, that is Tuesday, 3rd December, uh, there would be a visit to the India International Center. Now this is quite significant also, because their majesties had laid the foundation stone 60 years ago. Um, thereafter, their next two engagements are two calls on at the hotel, the first by the leader of the opposition in the Lok Sabha, and the second by the Vice President of India. Thereafter that day, there is some uh, time where there will uh, be some private engagements on their part, and then we move on to Wednesday, 4th December. Uh, 4th December is the day when they will emplane for Chennai. It is a two-city visit, Delhi and Chennai, so on the 4th in the morning, they leave for Chennai, and uh, their main engagement that day will be to visit the Kalakshetra Foundation. Uh, the next day, Thursday, 5th December, which is effectively their last day in India, they would be visiting the Children's Park at the Gindi National Park in Chennai. And then, of course, uh, uh, the main meeting, the meeting with the governor, uh, followed by a lunch that will be hosted by the governor in honor of their majesties. Uh, thereafter, after the lunch and some downtime, they will visit the Spastic Society of Tamil Nadu and round up their visit with a couple of private engagements in the hotel where they will meet representatives of Japanese expatriates in Chennai. 
they would be emplaining for Tokyo on the night of 5th December, so altogether a six-day visit. And needless to add, as I round up, that this is a state visit and a visit, I think, on which the Ministry of External Affairs has worked extremely hard. And now uh, we are much looking forward to welcoming their majesties to India. Thank you. Before we open up for questions, uh, since many of you, all of you represent media organizations, we just like to tell you, uh, for example, we have been, a, if any of you are interested, you can contact our colleagues. Uh, we've been able to dig out footage and photographs of their last visit, and these are available with us. If any of you would like to know what were the uh, places they visited, what were the photographs, these are all available. We are also showcasing them on our website. Uh, you may have seen, some of you may have seen that, that on a day-to-day -day basis we put in one different video footage and, and photograph uh, because uh, it's also a visit of nostalgia for, uh, as far as India hosting uh, some, uh, some dignitaries who've been here 50 years ago. We've never had that occasion. Uh, with those words, I now open the floor for questions that you may want to ask on anything. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Sunada of Kyodo News. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask who is going to uh, the airport, Air Palam, to welcome uh, the emperor. Uh, Prime Minister Dr. Mahmoud also. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, who will go to the airport? Um, we will have uh, uh, a complement of senior officials at the airport, uh, which is the standard norm for a state visit. There will be a minister accompanying who will also be at the airport, and for this particular visit, the minister accompanying is the external affairs minister, Mr. Salman Khurshid. As far as the prime minister's uh, presence at the airport is concerned, which point you have raised, uh, matters are still under finalization. These aspects are being finalized. Uh, but yes, there might uh, be a possibility of this. But I should also hasten to add uh, uh, in that vein that if this happens, this will not be the first time. There have been a couple of visits, uh, uh, the most notable in the recent past being that of President Obama, where the Prime Minister has gone to the airport to receive a distinguished visitor. So let us wait and see. Just to add to what she says, um, all that we've said is that we will try and make this visit as important as can be, that India can extend. So please uh, be certain that every aspect of protocol and importance will be given at every level to ensure that this will be a memorable visit. Yes, Nas. Actually, I would like to know uh, whether there's any special thing about choosing Chennai for visit. Um, as far as Chennai is concerned, uh, we've had, uh, before any visit, you know, there are lots of rounds of negotiations with the um, country's embassy based in New Delhi. And here I would like to tell you that it was the choice of the Japanese. The Japanese decided that they would like to take their majesties to Chennai for the uh, second leg of the visit. Yes, Surya? Uh, this visit is also about the um, parameters of our relationship, you know, the fact that there is a China angle here. Can you give us something about the, um, uh, the way defense ties are progressing and uh, uh, what is it that we are looking at? Uh, thank you, Surya. I think uh, one must bear in mind very clearly that this visit from the Japanese side is uh, a visit that is very high in symbolism. And the, uh, the practice in Japan is for the emperor to be studiously away from political issues and contemporary issues. And we would respect uh, the Japanese sentiments on this. And the, the nature of the visit is that it's a, it's a highly uh, symbolic visit. The, the Japanese emperor is the symbol of the Japanese state and the people. And essentially the way in which the, uh, the discussions would carry on would uh, therefore focus on the extraordinary maturity of the relationship over the past several decades. As you know, we recently celebrated last year the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations. 
uh, we have a very strong popular connectivity in terms of spirituality, culture, people-to-people -people exchanges. So this visit, to a certain degree, is a manifestation of, of that uh, aspect of the relationship, rather than getting into the points that you had mentioned. Yes, ma'am. This meeting uh, between the representatives of the Japanese expatriates and the emperor, is it a courtesy call or is it on the request of the representatives of the Japanese expatriates that this has been planned? Uh, this particular meeting that you're talking about has been organized completely by the Japanese side. This is their program and they have led on this. So this is not part of the program that MEA has uh, led on. And um, this is something that they have totally, uh, uh, th this is their program. And this is normal for heads of uh, government uh, or heads of state when they go out to have this sort of thing. We also do that regularly. And if I may add, I think in terms of uh, Chennai, as you know, there's a very large concentration of Japanese expatriates there, so that we suspect that it may also be a factor in deciding to visit Chennai. Uh, I'm Iwata, Sankei newspaper. Uh, I heard that uh, Mr. Salman Khrushchev has met or seen the Japanese emperor when he came here in 1961. Uh, is it true? Uh, well, let me, uh, I did ask this question to the minister and he did indicate that uh, his um, grandfather was the governor of Bihar at that stage. Uh, and uh, the crown prince and crown princess did visit Nalanda. And uh, he said that he was, I think, a seven-year-old at that stage. Uh, he has very fond memories of that. And he has specifically requested that we collect as many photos of their visit uh, to Patna. And uh, we have been able to collect those photos and uh, hand it over to the minister, who is very nostalgic and remembers this with great fondness. Yes, Sachin. So what is our understanding of why the emperor has chosen to visit India now? I'm asking this because the invitation from India to the emperor had apparently been pending for more than 10 years now. And such visits uh, take place apparently only at the advice of the Japanese cabinet. So if you could provide us with some understanding. Well, of course, we are deeply honored that he's chosen to visit us. And it would be, uh, I would say, uh, impolitic for us to speculate as to why he chose to visit us now. Uh, our invitation, as you correctly pointed out, has been a long-standing one. We've in, uh, invited him repeatedly. And uh, I think we are, we are looking at this visit, as I mentioned earlier, as a, as a reflection of the, the depth and maturity of the relationship. And I don't think we'd want to read anything more into why now, why not earlier, etc. So, uh, is there any proposal of Prime Minister of Japan's visit to India in coming months? Uh, you know, both India and Japan have an annual dialogue and it's normal that they will be, there was a dialogue earlier this year and th it's normal that there would be one next year too. Uh, yes, Subhajit. Sir, does this uh, visit have any bearing on the strategic partnership and uh, does it impact uh, anyway on the nuclear deal negotiations. Uh, Shubhajit, and, and as I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, draw the framework for, the, uh, for this visit here, and as I'm trying to uh, bring to your attention that the Japanese emperor's visits, which are very rare, uh, are essentially uh, manifestations of goodwill and popular sentiment towards another country, a friendly country. And we do not want to, uh, as you're suggesting, you know, look at this in a very uh, narrow prism in terms of day-to-day, -day, or shall we say, uh, immediate or mid medium-term diplomatic issues. The way in which we are looking at this relationship is uh, as a symbol of the goodwill of the, uh, of the emperor and the Japanese people towards India. And as I said, we're very honored to be able to 
accept this goodwill gesture from the Japanese side. Any agreement of importance likely to be signed during the visit of any historic importance? No, no agreements are envisaged during the visit. I think uh, what uh, all of you would do is best is to ask your uh, Japanese colleagues here about the role that the emperor plays in Japanese society and government. And I think uh, with that uh, background information, many of your questions will be answered because there are uh, specific uh, uh, sort of uh, there are specific norms on uh, how these visits and the role of the Japanese ambassador and that's those norms which are being abided by during this visit too. Yeah, any other question on any other thing? Oh, you still have one? Okay, and on anything else? Yeah, now the floor is open on anything else that you may like to ask. Yes, uh, Ranjana? Sir, so the, um, the, India has given the dossiers uh, to Pakistan on 26-11, but the lawyer for the seven uh, accused uh, has said that the evidence is, uh, is a sham and is ins insufficient evidence for the court. So, what? Ranjana, if your question is that uh, should I respond to some nondescript uh, individuals, my answer is that I will not do. But if your question is a little bit more substantive, that uh, do you think that India would uh, uh, just allow this uh, somebody to wish away what is a deeply, deeply felt in, uh, national sentiment that the perpetrators of 26-11 should be brought to book? My answer is that we will never allow that wish list to ever happen, not now not later, not ever. Now, if your question is about the quality of evidence that we have provided, my understanding is that when we've had discussions with the Pakistani, our Pakistani counterparts, uh, including the recent visit of uh, Mr. Sartaj Aziz to Delhi, we were assured repeatedly that all that they wanted was provided to them from evidence, uh, from information that they had asked us for. Having said that, I'd also like to emphasize that it is our firmly held belief that 99% of that evidence on the 2611 case is available in Pakistan because this conspiracy was hatched in Pakistan the people who undertook this were nationals of Pakistan. The training for this attack was undertaken in Pakistan. The financing for this attack was through banking or other channels which are in Pakistan. And therefore, it devolves on the government of Pakistan to ensure that evidence is provided from what is available with them, given the expanse of the evidence and the entire range of activities that were undertaken prior to this attack. I hope I've answered all aspects of your question. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Reema Sharma, DY365, New Channel from Northeast. So my question is that, uh, Bangladesh uh, is facing pole violence in this. Uh, then uh, it is 4,000 kilometer Assam and uh, West Bengal is sharing 4,000 kilometer border area. So do you worry about this uh, pole violence may get impact in Bangladesh is a democratic country which periodically goes to the poles. We've had uh, uh, our engagement with Bangladesh when they've had previous polls. Uh, uh, we respect their decisions to choose freely and democratically their governments. 
and therefore we wish them all the best in that endeavor and we do not see this as anything antithetical to our security or our uh, safety. Yes, Maria. Good afternoon. Re regarding the Italian Marines, I saw on the Hindustan Times today that there is a report about um, NEA seeking the death penalty for the Marines. Uh, can you confirm the news and also um, can you uh, explain what is the position of uh, the MEA regarding this issue? Maria, you know that um, from this uh, platform we do not comment on issues of an interministerial or interagency nature. That said, uh, so therefore, I do not have anything to say of speculative reporting on this. But if you would like to know the government of India's position on this, I think you should refer to the statement made on the floor of Parliament on 22nd March 2013 by the External Affairs Minister. Um, it's available on our website. I could uh, read out portions of that, but I think it's available. It explains clearly what is the government of India's position. Now, if your argument is that there may be some developments where X, Y, Z may have said something at this stage, I can assure you the government of India intends to abide by those statements that were made on the floor of the House in Parliament and any decision that we take will be a considered one, taking into account the policy framework that has been articulated in that statement to Parliament. Yes, Rajiv. Uh, Agbar, this is a question for you and Shambhu. Uh, as you know, uh, the eagle has overflown the dragon land. I'm referring to the overflight of uh, two unarmed uh, B-20, uh, B-2 uh, 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 bombers over uh, uh, China's so-called ADIZ. Now, what are your comments on that? And there are also reports. No, no this is this is uh, this is the. Uh, please listen to that. Yes. There are also reports that China is mulling over uh, a similar India-specific ADIZ. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, I think I'll answer that question. There no, no need for two people to answer that. And all I can say is that we are aware of uh, newspaper reports and other reports on this uh, issue. And uh, once we have a, s a statement to make, you will be the first to know about that. Thank you. Next, Parul. Is President Karzai visiting India next month uh, on the invite of the government of India? And uh, what will be on the agenda when he comes? I can confirm that President Karzai will be visiting India. And this is uh, in connection with an invitation he has received from an educational organization. Um, this is going to be during the second half of uh, uh, no, sorry, the second week of December. Um, it, as you are aware, the last time he visited India, he was invited by the lovely university in Punjab. Uh, on this occasion, this is another educational institution that has invited him. Um, and let me assure you, whenever President Karzai comes to India as an honored guest, he always does meet all important sections of Indian society, including our leadership. And so he will be received by the Prime Minister of India during his next visit to India in the second week of December. I think uh, it would be best if that university or that group of uh, organization, uh, educational institutions makes this public because this is an invitation from them. I have confirmed to you that the pre Prime Minister will meet him during his visit here. Now it's only proper for that educational organization to make it public, the nature of their invitation. But as far as we in government are concerned, every time President Karzai 
uh, who is a great friend of India, visits India, and he's always welcome to do so. He will be received with appropriate honor uh, that we extend to friends of India. <laughs> uh, well, I can play this game with you a little bit more, and I'll answer that its headquarters are not in Delhi. Yes, anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, just regarding Central African uh, Republic, which is descending to chaos, and uh, the UN is seeking troops as uh, one of the major contributors in the peacekeeping operation. Is India planning to, to contribute? We will let you know once we take a decision on that. Yes. Back to their Majesty's visit again. Sorry. Welcome. Uh, um, Her Majesty, um, Empress, she was supposed to be visiting India in 1998 to take part in an international conference, but from an obvious reason, Japanese government advised her not to go to India. But anyway, she took part, not directly, but uh, through sending a video message of keynote speech to that conference. How does the present-day government of India take her decision back then? Well, you know, as you rightly said, the uh, Empress had addressed the uh, Congress of the International Board on Books for Young People. And we are aware of uh, her great interest in children's literature. Uh, we have been also been told that she has a great interest in the Panchatantra. And I think we're going to let it rest at that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you wanted, isn't it? So uh, my question is uh, regarding about the air defense, uh, Chinese, the, you know. I think I've answered that question. Yeah, but uh, Indians' flight is also going to flying over that area. So, uh, like for example, Japanese com government have, you know, said you don't, the company don't need to reply that. What's uh, India's reaction on that? I just answered that. Just give me. I've just answered that question, saying that uh, you will be now the second person to be informed of it since Rajiv is the first. He's taken over that slot. Anyone else? Yes, Sandeep. So, if you're having a briefing on WTO ministerial at Bali, then it's okay. But. <laughs> Otherwise, I wanted to ask about the peace clause. Uh, what is India's stand on the two-year, four-year thing? And what are the other issues besides this food thing that uh, India puts up front at the ministerial? Sandeep, my understanding is that the Ministry of Commerce will have a separate detailed briefing on all these aspects. So let's wait for that. Yes, Vishal. So following the interim arrangement between Iran and P5 plus 1, uh, what is the kind of opportunity that uh, it opens up for India in terms of oil trade and uh, also Indian investments in Chabahar and the land routes to Central Asia? Uh, the, the Iranian uh, Deputy Foreign Minister was here for Foreign Office consultations. Uh, did this process, was this taken forward? Yes, uh, the Iranian Deputy Foreign Minister, Mr. Rahim uh, Ibrahim Poor, was in uh, Delhi. Uh, he did meet the Foreign Secretary. Um, he did provide a detailed briefing on their assessment of the situation as it would evolve following the interim agreement between Iran and the E3 plus 3. Uh, at this stage, he also indicated that uh, things need to be watched as we go forward because, as you are aware, the document of that interim agreement is now publicly available. There are a series of steps that are likely to, uh, to be unveiled as we go along uh, through their mechanism of a joint commission, etc. Uh, as far as India is concerned, uh, we have always held that uh, uh, we would like to engage uh, Iran economically and any issues that Iran has with other parts of the world should not uh, impede uh, uh, our legitimate economic interactions with Iran. And therefore, uh, 
economic, uh, sorry, energy is a major area of cooperation between India and Iran, and we intend to pursue that. Similarly, uh, we have, as you are all aware, a very keen interest in the Chabahar port. Uh, that per se does not uh, get affected directly by any sanctions that are currently in place because it, those sanctions, even of a unilateral nature, do not have an impact directly on port-related activities. So, we intend to pursue that also actively. In addition, we are also in touch with Iran with other possibilities to uh, strengthen our uh, energy cooperation and that will be unveiled as uh, time goes ahead because I think it's not prudent to tell in advance of decision making on matters of that nature uh, the outcomes. But you can be certain that there are activities which we are considering. If that is so, then thank you very much for being very patient and for coming here this afternoon. Thank you. Just one minute. Sorry, I, I just wanted to also inform you that uh, uh, former Prime Minister of uh, Japan, Mr. Yoshiro Mori, will also be part of the Emperor's delegation. As many of you who have been following India-Japan relations are aware, he is one of the key uh, personalities who's played a very transformational role in India-Japan relations. I just wanted to mention he's the, he's uh, what they call the head of the official suite as part of the delegation. Just a point of fact. Thank you. Thank you very much.